welcome to a new session of Introduction to World Literature. Today we will be reading the short story Bartleby the Scrivener written by Herman Melville. Herman Melville was born in New York in 1819. He is known as an American novelist and has also written short stories and poems. His novels are mostly known for uh, explorations of uh, sea voyages and expeditions as a sailor because at a young age um, his family was not in a very well off situation. So, his elder brother finds for him a job as a cabin boy in a merchant ship. Later, he also finds work as a cabin crew in several whaler ships such as Acushnet and Lucy Ann. So, in, during these sea voyages in these whaling ships, uh, he has got several experiences uh, and has also spent some considerable amount of time in uh, the Marquesas Islands with the Polynesian tribes there. So, on his way back uh, with his family members, he used to share all these experiences and they found considerable interest in these stories. So, this gives him the idea of putting these expeditions and adventures in the form of novels and that is how he starts writing uh, novels based on these sea expeditions and the first one being Taipei which is based on his experiences uh, on the Marquesas Islands and this becomes a very popular work and he becomes very successful as a writer with this work following which he also writes other works such as Omu, Murdy, Redburn, White Jacket, Moby Dick, Pierre and Confidence Man. This is some of his well known works of which Moby Dick is known as the classic in American literature. It is the story of uh, the white whale Moby Dick and uh, the fight between this white whale Moby Dick and the captain of the ship Pecord, uh, Captain Ahab and uh, through this story of the uh, conflict between Moby Dick and Ahab, uh, which seems to be at the outset a story of uh, uh, sea voyage and sea expedition. Herman Melville talks in detail about the conflicts of vice and virtue and he goes into the philosophical broodings and he explores deep into the human mind and the extent to which revenge and urge can take man to. Apart from these novels, he has also written short stories like Bartleby the Scrivener, The Encant Das, Benito Sereno, etc. And also, uh, he has tried his hands at poetry with collections such as John Marr and other sailors with some sea pieces, etc. He was tremendously influenced by the transcendental philosophy and the works of Ralph Waldo Emerson and also the work by Nathaniel Hawthorne, the novel The Scarlet Letter has been a terrific influence on him. And uh, during his stay in his farmhouse in Massachusetts, the Arrowhead, he got an opportunity to have a close interaction with the author Nathaniel Hawthorne and uh, this interaction has been an influence on him so much so that uh, it even reflected on his kind of writings which, uh, um, which also dealt with uh, questions of vice, virtue, sin, um, evil etc. And uh, apart from these works, the last work to be written by him was Billy, Billy Butt. It is an unfinished novella and it was published posthumously in 1924. Now, coming to the story for today's class, which is Bartleby the Scrivener, a story of Wall Street. It was published originally in 1853 in the Putnam's Monthly Magazine and later it was included in the anthology, The Piazza Tales, published in 1856. The main characters of this story are a lawyer who is unnamed and he is the narrator who has an office in the Wall Street and the employees in this work in this workspace in his office Turkey and Nippers, Ginger Nut and Office Boy and Bartleby form the uh, major characters of the story. Now all these characters are presented from the point of view of the narrator, the lawyer and they all have very unique character traits. The narrator begins the story by saying that uh, he himself is an interesting character because all who know me consider me as an eminently safe man. Uh, he considers himself to be not an ambitious person, uh, but he has a very secure uh, professional uh, reputation because he has got good clients. He is not the kind of person who wants to be successful by hook or by crook. Um, he follows the Christian values and morality um, so strongly in his life and that is the way he presents himself uh, throughout the story. And it is through his point of view we get to know about other uh, employees at his office space. The first one is Turkey. Turkey is a copyist. He is an old English man in his 60s. And uh, the character interesting fact about this uh, Turkey is that he works very efficiently in the morning, but he has a very bad temper in the afternoon. So he is very careless and he leaves stains of ink on the papers. So, this is the character trait of Turkey. On the other hand, the second copyist at his office space is Snippers. He is a young and ambitious man of 25. 
and in contrast to Turkey, uh, he is good at working in the uh, afternoons. In the morning, uh, he has he is of, he often has uh, uh, issue of indigestion. So uh, this makes him very restless. So he what he does is he con um, he keeps on adjusting the height of his table, and he spends his uh, morning hours mostly on these kind of unwanted or unnecessary issues. But in the afternoons, he becomes stable. So this very contrasting working. Uh, uh, um, preferences of Turkey and Nippers uh, is quite amusing to the lawyer. What the lawyer does is he gives all the important work, paperwork to Turkey in the morning hours and he gives him minor work or less important legal documents in the afternoon. So, on the other hand, Nippers is given all the important work in the uh, afternoon hours. And Nippers is so much ambitious that apart from his copywriting business, he also tries to write original legal documents which uh, the lawyer knows, but he tries to kind of uh, ignore all those uh, aspects or ignore such uh, attempts by Nippers. Apart from these two copies, there is one more character which is a 12 year old boy called Gingernut and uh, originally he was sent to the lawyer by his father so that he would uh, he could get an opportunity to, st to study uh, law with this uh, narrator. But uh, that never really materializes, instead he works as a sweeper, cleaner and an errant boy and his uh, common errand is to buy ginger nut cakes for both nippers and turkey and that is how he hence ends up getting the name ginger nut. And the last character and perhaps the most important character of the story is Bartleby. Uh, he is a very quiet and reserved and strange person. He talks to no one in the office but he is very hard working and he works day in and day out. Now coming to the plot of the story, uh, the entire story is uh, the narrator, the lawyer's perspective about Bartleby and his strange life. And in the words of the narrator, uh, this story is the life of Bartleby, who is the scrivener of the strangest kind he has ever seen or heard of. Uh, and he begins the story initially by giving us an idea about all these other characters at his office space, be it gingers or turkey or nippers and their interesting character traits and what they normally do in the office space and how he eventually comes to uh, hire Bartleby in his, in his office. So, he has as, as he mentions in the beginning of the story, he has a very uh, good reputation and uh, he has immense a very good number of clients and as his business prospers, it is not enough to have just turkey and nippers at his office space because they are uh, good at work, good at their work only at one time of the day. So, it is uh, necessary for him to hire one more person. So, he floats an advertisement in the newspaper and in response Bartleby appears and Bartleby is there thus appointed as the new copyist in the uh, office space. And uh, this is what uh, he states, the narrator says about Bartleby and his performance in the story. I read, at first Bartleby did an extraordinary quantity of writing, as if long famishing for something to copy, he seemed to gorge himself on my documents. There was no pause for digestion, he ran day and night line, copying by sunlight and by candlelight. I should have been quite delighted with his application had he been cheerfully industrious, but he wrote on silently, palely, mechanically. So this impression uh, that Bartleby has on the lawyer is quite interesting because uh, he is quite happy that he hired Bartleby as his copies because unlike Nippers in Turkey, this is someone who works whole day without even taking a break. The only problem that he finds with Bartleby is that he does not do his work cheerfully Rather, he is very silent, pale and mechanical at his job which is quite paradoxical because he is doing something which does not require any amount of creative spirit. He is just copying legal documents, he is just a working uh, a human photocopy machine if you can say so. And, and then strangely, the lawyer expects him to be very cheerful at his work, but there is nothing strange given the fact that he has to do a mechanical job like this that he is very silent and pale. Or one day he calls uh, Bartleby to his office. Uh, for the purpose of proofreading the copies he himself has scribed. But this is what happens, without moving from his privacy, Bartleby in a singularly mild firm voice replies, I prefer not to. So this comes in as a surprise for the lawyer because he never expected Bartleby to deny a work that he was asked to do. He was not asked to do a proofreading of somebody else's copies, but rather the copies that he himself made, but he refuses. And this resistance to his employer was not an expression of anger, impatience or impertinence, rather he refuses to proofread with a sense of composure. 
So, this makes it all the more difficult for the lawyer to scold Bartleby because uh, this refusal is not an expression of anger, he is not rebellious, he just says with a sense of composure that I am not ready to and in Bartleby's word I'm, I would not prefer to do uh, anything but copywriting. So, the refusal makes him a little irritated. So, the lawyer tries to reason out with Bartleby saying that he is expected to proofread the copies that he himself makes so that it will be easy uh, for the work to go efficiently and smoothly. But there is no point in reasoning out with Bartleby because he completely uh, refuses to listen to or to accept the explanations made by the lawyer. And after this, he also notices that apart from say keeps uh, apart from the fact that Bartleby refuses or prefers not to do any other job than copywriting, there are also several other interesting aspects to his life. For example, the lawyer observes that he never went to dinner as in Bartleby never went to dinner. Indeed, he never even went anywhere as yet I had never of my personal knowledge known him to be outside my office. He was a perpetual sentry in the corner and all that he had for his dinner was a handful of ginger nuts with the, which the boy would buy for him and he would in return uh, give the cakes back to the boy. So, slowly the lawyer uh, starts observing Bartleby more. This strange case of Bartleby amuses the lawyer so much so that he even tries to or makes an attempt to befriend Bartleby, but the attempt is uh, a failure because the response from Bartleby's side is very passive. Uh, he does not open up. Uh, even when the lawyer asks him some questions, uh, personal questions, he, he, his answer is, I prefer not to share all these things with you. But the lawyer worries that if he dismisses Bartleby, then other employers may not behave well with him and he might end up jobless. So, there is a sense of compassion or there is a sense of concern that the lawyer expresses towards Bartleby uh, and he realizes that Bartleby is strange because there is something wrong about him, but he is not able to realize what exactly is wrong with him because Bartleby is uh, not ready to open up or share his personal life with anybody. So, there are several such attempts of kind uh, to, to be kind and compassionate to him by the lawyer, but finally one day he gets irritated. And this is the instant uh, he asks the lawyer asks Bartleby to go to the post office uh, because ginger nuts is not around. And as usual, the staple reply comes, which is, I prefer not to. So, this completely irritates the lawyer and he shouts at him, but the response is the same. So, uh, as I said, this response is not in a, in a tone of anger, there is no sense of rebellion in his voice, and it is difficult for the lawyer to uh, retaliate or to. Uh, push him and force him uh, in any means and all at every instance when he r denies any form of job, uh, the lawyer is not ready to push the argument further because he has got other important works to do. So, he keeps those arguments uh, abrupt, he ends it abruptly and realizes that there is no point in arguing out with him further and he leaves it to the way it is and finally, the situation becomes such that. Uh, that everybody in the office realizes that this is how Bartleby is. So, this is the excerpt from the text. The conclusion of this whole business was that it soon became a fixed fact of my chambers that a pale young scrivener by the name of Bartleby had a desk there that he copied for me at the usual rate of 4 cents a folio, but he was permanently exempt from examining the work done by him that duty being transferred to turkey and nippers. So, the only solution that lawyer has in front of him is to uh, give the duty of proofreading this uh, uh, these uh, copies made by Bartleby to Turkey and Nippers, so that they would also think themselves to be uh, superior to Bartleby. And he even asked them for uh, opinion about Bartleby to both Turkey and Nippers and even to Ginger Nut and they all say that he is a very strange man, he is a loony person, he is a madman. So, there is nothing more than that, that even uh, these other colleagues of Bartleby uh, has to say about him. And finally, the conclusion is that Bartleby was never on any account to be dispatched on the most trivial errand of any sort and that even if entreated to take upon him such a matter, it was generally understood that he would prefer not to, in other words that he would refuse point blank. So, everybody realizes in the office that this is how Bartleby is, there is no point in arguing out with him, he would refuse everything point blank and he would only do the job of copywriting because that is why he was hired or that is why he had accepted the job. And one day, apart from all these strange incidents, 
the lawyer also comes to know that Bartleby lives in the office space. One, mon one Sunday morning on his way to church because he is early, he decides to go to this office and he is surprised to see that uh, the room is locked from inside and it is actually Bartleby and Bartleby asks him to come back after a few minutes because he is occupied. This also uh, surprises the lawyer but he cannot say anything, he cannot make an argument, he knows that. So he goes and comes back after a few minutes and sees the uh, room is open for him and uh, he goes inside and sees that upon, cl upon more closely examining the place I surmise that for an indefinite period Bartleby must have ate, dressed and slept in my office and that too without plate, mirror or bed. The cushion seat of a rickety old sofa in one corner bore the faint impress of a lean reclining foam. Rolled away under his desk I found a blanket, under the empty grate a blacking box and brush, on a chair a tin basin with soap and a ragged towel, in a newspaper a few crumbs of ginger nuts and a morsel of cheese. Yes, thought I, it is evident enough that Bartleby has been making his home here, keeping a bachelor's hall all by himself. So once he closely examines the office space, he realizes that he literally lived there, he really lived in this space and nobody knew this and all that he possessed are a, perhaps a sheet of blanket, some uh, a few a ragged towel, a soap and he also has a small savings in which is neatly tied in a handkerchief. So this is all the possession that Bartleby has. At first there is a sense of shock to the lawyer that he did not even know that Bartleby was occupying that office and making it his living room, uh, his living space as well. Uh, that shocks him but later it immediately occurs to him that uh, he lives this way because he is such a, a solitary person, there is nobody else in this world that he is at least familiar or acquainted with and uh, he compares this case of Bartleby to that of the general, uh, uh, the Roman general and statesman Marius uh, after his transformation into an innocent man and uh, the, the reference is to a painting of Marius uh, brooding among the ru ruins of the city Carthage uh, which was uh, demolished by the Romans. So that uh, fall of a great man and the fall of a great city and the innocence and the transformation that Marius uh, undergoes is compared to uh, and Bartleby is compared to this uh, innocent and transformed Marius by uh, the lawyer and he thinks about the fraternal melancholy. So every time uh, an interaction with Bar uh, Bartleby happens. Uh, this gives the lawyer an opportunity to think about humanity, to think about the strange way in which people live and he keeps on brooding over these kind of uh, thoughts in his mind and he states happiness courts the light so we deem the world is gay but misery hides aloof so we deem that misery there is none. So uh, after seeing the way in which Bartleby has been living and the solitariness in his life, he realizes that just because the world around us seems to be so happy and its uh, happiness is visible everywhere does not mean that there is no misery in the world, misery hides aloof and uh, it may not be that visible to us. So this is the idea that comes to his mind when he thinks about Bartleby and he also realizes that perhaps this Krivner is the victim of innate and incurable disorder. I might give alms to his body but his body did not pain him, it was his soul that suffered and his soul I could not reach. So the lawyer is uh, able to understand that Bartleby is deeply scarred or deeply wounded at heart. So there is no proper cure to him and uh, the way he behaves, the, the strangeness or the peculiarity of his, uh, of his behavior is resulting from the wounds that he uh, has in his uh, the wounds he has, the wounds he have got in his heart and his soul is suffering so deeply that it is probably, uh, um, resu it has probably resulted in some sort of a disorder in him. Therefore, he makes a further attempt to try and speak to Bartleby but again as expected uh, there is a complete uh, denial on Bartleby's side and he is passive, he does not want to open up to anybody. This time the lawyer takes it a little negatively because he believes that this disdain on Bartleby's part uh, seems to be a little ungrateful considering the undeniable good usage and indulgence he had received from me. So there is some expectation on the lawyer's side from Bartleby because even after constant denial of work, even after being uh, so uh, careless or haphazard about other kinds of works that he had been asked to do in the office, uh, 
uh, he had been re he was retained by the lawyer and even being so grateful e even being such a understanding uh, employer Bartby does not seem to be grateful to the lawyer so this makes him a little irritated and uh, he thinks that this this is not right on the part of Bartleby to deny even an opportunity to uh, open up with him apart from this he also realizes that Bartleby's uh, presence in this office has also influenced uh, others other people working there because now everybody starts using the word prefer uh, inadvertently in their vocabulary so this uh, particular situation in the office keeps on uh, without much change, Bartleby ju just uh, do his uh, work of copying and others do the proofreading job. But one fine day, uh, Bartleby altogether gives up his job of copywriting. He does nothing, but he stands at his window and stares out to the brick wall in a reverie. And when asked that why he is not doing his job, he replies that he has permanently given up copying. So now the situation becomes really worse and there is no other option left with the lawyer. So he asks him to leave the office in a period of six days but he does not. So he even tries to give Bartleby some money and ask him to leave but nothing helps and Bartleby is in one, uh, he has uh, decided that he would not leave the place no matter what happens. Uh, there is nothing that the, the lawyer seems helpless but the biblical verse comes to his mind which is uh, everybody should love each other. A new commandment give I unto you that ye love one another. Despite being angry, despite being helpless at the situation, he realizes that people should love each other, people should have concern for each other. So there is no option uh, left with him, push him out of the office and he lets him stay without even doing his job. But what happens is slowly Bartleby's presence in the office affects his business. His clients are not very happy seeing this person who constantly stares out, out of the window and does nothing. And this uh, worries the lawyer further because it, it begins to aff uh, affect his reputation and he is worried about his own business. And therefore, no, with no other option left, the lawyer finally decides to shift the office to a new building and uh, end this complete interaction with Bartleby and this to take him completely out of his uh, professional life. But what happens is the new tenant who occupies this building comes to meet the lawyer and he complains that Bartleby is still residing in that office and that he is refusing to quit the premise. So afraid of a scandal what he does is he, he goes to the building and tries to persuade Bartleby to leave but he does not. He says I prefer not to and I would continue uh, to stay here. And it is finally the landlord of the building who uh, with the help of the police takes Bartleby and he is shifted to the tombs which is the city run jail in Manhattan and he is taken in as an inmate and he is uh, uh, considering him as a vagrant. So as a part of the procedure of the police the lawyer is called and he goes to the uh, detention center in Manhattan and uh, also gives verdict for him and says that Bartleby is in fact an honest man only that he is a little strange with his behavior. And he feels very bad for the condition that or the plight of Bartleby. So he asks one of the staff in this detention center to take a good care of him and to provide him with decent facilities. But uh, there is nothing more that uh, the lawyer can do for him. And eventually in a few, uh, in a few weeks time, uh, the lawyer comes to know that Bartleby has passed away in the detention center. And in a few months time, he also comes to know of a rumor, uh, which is he is not sure about it, but he somehow comes to know that Bartleby previously worked in the debt letter office at Washington. Debt letter office is a place where all those uh, uh, letters which have no takers are brought together and burnt. So he thinks that probably uh, working in a space like that for a long period might have affected him so deeply and all the uh, positivity optimism in, my, in his life might have been completely drained out after working in such a space and think, thinking about it uh, and thinking about Bartleby he worries and he, um, he kind of broods about the strange way in which humans or people live around the world. So some of the major themes from this story first of all as um, First of all, uh, isolation and solitariness. We know that the character of Bartleby uh, stands for, uh, is metaphorical to the concept of isolation and solitariness. Someone who works in a very busy space like Wall Street is completely isolated. He is a recluse and there is uh, no interest in him to even speak to people. 
and this talks a lot about the urban space and the busy world of commerce and business where there is no human connect or uh, uh, there is no uh, communication possible. So, if you look at the story throughout you do not see these uh, colleagues uh, attempting to even uh, uh, make a conversation possible with uh, Bartleby, he refuses it, he is someone who has completely lost that uh, hope in humanity and uh, he realizes uh, somehow there is in Bartleby there is a belief that uh, you know there is no possibility in having a conversation, there is no use in having a conversation uh, because after all just like in the death letter office human emotions are something like those death letters, there are no takers for it. And the second uh, connected to this theme is the theme of the mechanical nature of nature of work in the Wall Street. From dead letter office, uh, the, from after working in dead letter office, um, Bartleby actually comes to work in a space like a lawyer's office and what he does there is uh, to copy, make copies of these legal documents. So, there is no nothing positive or there is nothing refreshing in this work, it is just a mechanical work and as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation itself, this is something uh, which is uh, where human, uh, these people be it, mm, be it Turkey or Nippers or even Bartleby, they are just uh, human photocopy machines, they just have to sit there and making make copies of existing documents and which are very dry papers. So, there is nothing more that is expected of these uh, employees in Wall Street and their mechanical nature of work and how this affects their life is also shown in a much deeper sense through the characterization of Bartleby. The question of compassion and humanity which is reflected in the work is quite problematic because at, at the outset the lawyer comes across as a very compassionate person, uh, he cares for people, he has, uh, he has an understanding, he tries to understand all his uh, colleagues, all his employees. So, instead of scolding them or instead of comp dismissing them for their uh, lack of uh, dedication to their work, uh, he tries to understand them and he tries to make a way around all these things so that work, his work is not affected. But the question is, is he showing this compassion really because he really care for them or is he completely uh, concerned about his business and his uh, profession that he does not want any kind of uh, conflict to arise between him and his employees and is it the reason why he shows this compassion which is very superficial. The fourth point as I mentioned is uh, about the lack of communication connect. Uh, throughout the story we never get to know the real names of Nippers, Turkey and Ginger Nut. They all are the nicknames that they have given to each other based on their strange character and the lawyer who seems to be very concerned and care and very compassionate to all these employees do not even, he does not even know them personally, he does not know about their family, he does not even mention the uh, real names of these uh, his staff. So, uh, there is a clear lack of communication and connect that is very visible in the story and he tries to cover up all these things, the lawyer or the narrator, the, he tries to cover up all these things uh, through his philosophical brooding. So, what are the things that he has in his mind or uh, how these people come across to him. So, it is a very detached uh, point of view or a detached standpoint that the uh, narrator takes. So, and it works in a way of overcoming the uh, problems or the, the sense of guilt that he has in his mind. So, based on all this we can put these two points for discussion. First one is I prefer not to which is Bartleby's staple sta uh, statement throughout the story and perhaps this is the only thing that you uh, that we ever come to hear Bartleby saying. So, does it actually speak for Bartleby's agency because uh, yes by saying I prefer not to he is able to refuse the commands or the request made by his employer and there is no sense of uh, res, uh, rebellion coming across, but he clearly states his uh, stand that he will not do anything which he is not interested in and that expresses his agency without being arrogant. But does it mean that he is actually an empowered person is the question because at some point he really comes across as a victim of this world of commerce and business where there is no space for human emotions. So, this is a point that we can that is there for you to discuss uh, or to think further as you read the story. And the second one is the reliability of the narrator's voice as I mentioned uh, the sense of compassion or the sense of care and concern that he expresses uh, towards his uh, employ employees are they is it real or is it because of some sort of guilt because he knows that it is um, uh, somewhere he is also responsible for this uh, 
state of Bartleby and as well as the other characters because they are constantly working for him and for the uh, prosper uh, for for his work to be for his business to prosper and this mechanical work is what leads them to uh, the way they are. So, there is a sense of guilt and perhaps that is why uh, he makes multiple attempts to talk to Bartleby, but those attempts are also very shallow because uh, what he actually does is to ask him uh, whether he is ready to open up and once he says he prefers no to, he ends his attempt at that, he does not go further, he does not even uh, make any other, he does not even think of any other possibilities to give Bartleby a better space to occupy. He inhabits this complete world of, uh, he is completely immersed in his professional life and he is constantly worried about his reputation as a uh, good uh, lawyer and that is why when Bartleby uh, seems to affect his reputation and when the clients are complaining, uh, he is worried about scandals, he is worried about what people would think about him and whether it would affect his profession and that leads him to change the office to a new space. So, he is someone who is clearly not interested in any kind of conflict or any kind of scandal, he wants a smooth life as he states in the beginning of the story that he believes that the best way to live life is the easiest way. So, this uh, when re when read when we take all these things about the way the narrator presents the story and his point of view, uh, the reliability of the narrator becomes little problematic because his uh, compassion can also be read as uh, arising out of his sense of guilt and his attitude towards his employees is also a matter of uh, uh, it is a matter of debate or a contest because uh, th what he com what comes across as his understanding about of his employees is not really uh, an understanding rather it is his way of dealing uh, with them in such a way that they do not really affect his work and he can make a way with them and circumvent all the possible conflicts. So, I hope you can um, keep these things in mind while you read the story, it is a long story, but uh, read it with all these points in mind and I hope you had a clear understanding of the story, thank you.